in collaboration with the Alameda County Bar Association, this is Love Thy Lawyer, where we talk with members of the ACBA about their lives and legal careers. I'm Lewis Goodman, the host of the LTL podcast, and yes, I'm a member of the Alameda County Bar Association. She went to law school with Ruth Bader Ginsburg. She was instrumental in developing the behavioral court system in conjunction with the John George Psychiatric Pavilion for the Alameda County Superior Court. For years, she presided over the Berkeley Municipal Court and often knew the defendants from their prior appearances before her. Her husband, James, is a senior partner at Morrison and Forrester, and their daughter, Amy, is a judge in Minnesota. Judge Carol Brosnahan, welcome to the Alameda County Bar Association and the Love Thy Lawyer podcast. Thank you very much. Now you can ask me questions. <laughs> well, it's so nice to see you, and it's so nice to be in a position of being able to ask you some questions after all those years of you asking me questions. How long have you been retired from the Alameda County bench now? August the 1st of last year, but basically before that, because of the virus, because of COVID, nothing was happening for almost a year. Where are you from originally? I'm originally from New York City. I grew up in uh, Queens and went to Jamaica High. And What did you do in I, high school? I was very, very, no one will believe this, but I was very, very shy and very bookish. And all I did was read and not didn't do very much. Uh, they oh they made me most likely to succeed, which I could not understand, but they did. <laughs> well, I guess they were right. No, that, that was in high school. Well, when you graduated from Jamaica High in Queens, where did you go to college? I went to Wellesley. I went to Wellesley, and this is an interesting thing for a number of your younger people who may be watching that post podcast. I went on a quota. They had a quota of Jews. They would not let in more than 15% girls who were Jewish. And that was true in, I think, a number of the seven sisters during those years. I went in 1951 to Wellesley. And was it an all-girls school at the time? Oh, yes. And they had a, a motto or something like that, which was translated by many of the classmates to be not to be ministers, but to be ministers' wives. I majored in economics. And after I graduated, I had wanted to go to the Harvard Law School, uh, the Harvard Business School, and they didn't take women. So you went to Harvard Law School? After a year. What did you do in the intervening year? I worked as an assistant investment counselor at the Bank of New York. And i that was an interesting experience, too, because they didn't really, I, I, we handled the portfolios of very wealthy people, but they didn't want the very wealthy people to know that there were actually women who were handling their portfolios. So we were kind of kept in the back room to do the investment counseling, and they would have front men meeting with the with the clients. So when did you apply to law school? I applied to law I applied to law school late. I had taken the LSAT and sent in my an a partial application. And then I changed my mind about I didn't think I was going to go, but I changed my mind so about a month before classes started, I called the law school and I said, I spoke to Dean and I said, I've changed my mind. Can I come? And he said, well, let me check your record and I'll call you back. And he called me back and said, okay, you can come to the Harvard Law School. And that's how I got to the Harvard Law School. Well, what was that experience like? I mean, was it like the paper chase? Oh, yes. Oh, yes. It was an interesting experience because as you mentioned, I was in a class with nine, uh, with Ruth Ginsburg, but there were only nine women altogether in the class of 525. Wow. 
So we were a little bit in an odd situation, but it was it was definitely paper chase in terms of some of the professors. Others were a little bit more relaxed about it, but there were some professors who really, like the dean, did not want us there. The story that Ruth has told, and which is a true story, is that the dean had all of us over on when we were freshmen women and said, you are taking the place of a man who will do something with the profession. Mm -hmm. And uh, that was how our beginning experience at the Harvard Law School. But there were some professors who were very amenable to our being there. One of them was Professor Albert Sachs, who became the dean of the law school. And in fact, at one point offered me a job heading the continuing legal education in the state of Massachusetts. Well, what what's prompted you to start thinking about law, about wanting to be a lawyer in the first place? Well, I wanted, I wanted a profession, and I had really wanted to be in the business field. But my dad had, uh, had a law degree, although he never practiced law when I was growing up because he became a lawyer during the depression and really couldn't make a living. But he's always loved the law. And I just became intrigued with what could be done by a woman as a lawyer and decided I would do it. What was your first legal job? My first was a semi-legal job. Because I was, we moved, when Jim and I got married, we moved to Arizona. And at that time, they weren't really hiring women. We were friendly, actually, with uh, the justice, Sandra O'Day O'Connor, and she couldn't get a job either. So I took a job as secretary to the Senate Judiciary Committee. Well, at some point, you made your way to California. Oh, yes. Well, Jim got a job as uh, an assistant U.S. attorney. He had been in AUSA in Phoenix and got a job in San Francisco. And at that time, we had Amy, who was two, and Jimmy, who was four months. And that brought us to California. And then 21 months later, we had Lisa. And so when we first came to California, I took the California bar, but I did not practice law until Lisa was one. And then I got a job working for continuing education of the bar. And I started out as a fact checker and then began to edit books and then began to plan programs, and then became what they call director of local bar relations and went and met with the representatives of the local bars about CEB programs. Did you go directly from that job to the bench or did you? I did. Yeah. And I, I had been on, uh, on a state commission. I was on the Fair Political Practices Commission when it first started. And I had also uh, gotten to know a number of lawyers throughout the, the state through my CEB work. And it, so some lawyers put in a good word for me. And I was appointed by Jerry Brown the first in, to replace Wilmot Sweeney on the Berkeley Municipal Court. And I was very, very lucky. Now, if a young woman was just coming out of college, would you recommend the law as a career to her? Absolutely, because it's challenging. And right now, there are infinitely more opportunities for women in the law than there were when I started out or when Ruth started out. There are talented women litigators who a good friend of ours is head was head of the of a boda the american board of trial advocates and women women can go anywhere now in the profession 
and including legislatures, which where we really need more more lawyers. What advice would you give to a young person, woman or man coming out of law school and starting a career? What sort of advice would you give? Take any job that really will interest you. Don't don't be in it for the money. What about advice to an attorney who has an interest in being a judge? What would you say to that individual? Think about your temperament. Being a judge is a very different role. And some people are suited for it. Some people are not. It's a great job. And it's a very challenging job. Sometimes you get very cranky attorneys, which uh, I think you know about. Uh, Well, yeah. You know, as a matter of fact, before we started recording, I just mentioned that when I was a young lawyer and I'd only been practicing for a very short time, I didn't really think you were a very good judge. And then after I'd been practicing for a couple of years, I was really amazed at how much you had learned, to paraphrase Mark Twain. You, You met Jim at Harvard Law School, didn't you? Yeah. Do you know the story of how Jim and I met? Please tell it. It was third year at the law school, and I was working my way through, and I took a job thanks to, I was secretary to the law school public defenders, and a guy by the name of Paul Rennie said, there are six guys, we have a house on the corner of the law school, but none of us can cook. And I said, I would do the cooking in exchange for my meals, as long as I didn't have to do any of the dirty work, any of the dishes or anything. And that was on, so on September the 29th, I started cooking and met a guy by the name of Jim Brosnahan. On three weeks later, we were engaged. And three weeks after that, we got married on November the 8th, and we have celebrated now our 61st wedding anniversary and are moving on to hopefully many more. Well, congratulations. (laughs) So uh, another reason for a young woman to go to law school is you can meet (laughs) some really cool guys. (laughs) I don't think the ratio is as good anymore as it was when you were there. Probably not. Is there something that you know now that you really wish you'd known before you became a judge? I wish I had known more about the troubles that people have that either may be of their own making or may not be of their own making. And I, in terms of poverty, in terms of mental illness, in terms of the the hardships that they have to face for one reason or another. What, if anything, would you change about the way the legal system works? I would have more emphasis on the collaborative court type of system. I don't believe that incarceration is always the best alternative. Do Do you think that the legal system is fair? Not totally. No, just give you a stark example where a child support, a child custody case where one party has an attorney and the other does not. A landlord tenant case where the tenant does not have a lawyer and the, the landlord does. That's why there is such a great need for right to counsel in civil cases. For many years, you and Jim were both uh, very involved in the Inns of Court program. I'm wondering if you could tell us a little bit about that. And for those people who are not familiar with it, give us a brief introduction to the Inns of Court. The Inn of Court is simply a wonderful experience, especially for young lawyers, I think. It's an organization which is intended for judges, lawyers of all different aspects of the profession to get together on a social basis and get to know each other outside of the courtrooms. And the, and I just can't speak highly enough of the opportunities that you get from the end of court. This podcast is presented and supported by the Alameda County Bar Association. 
ACBA provides a wide range of certified continuing legal educational programs, networking opportunities, and social events. If you are a member of ACBA, thank you. If you are not yet a member, we hope you will consider joining this organization that is by, for, and in support of practicing attorneys. And now, back to our interview. What kind of things keep you up at night? What do you worry about? I worry. It keeps me up at night worrying about what's going to happen to our country, what's going to happen to our democracy. I, I really do worry about that. We're on a precipice right now. If you came into some real money, let's say you and Jim came into three or four billion dollars, what, if anything, different would you do in your life? Not much. We'd probably spend more time at Tahoe, but I don't think it would change us at all. Let's say you had a magic wand that was one thing you could change in the legal system or in the world in general. Is there one thing that you would like to wave that wand at and change? I'd like to change hatred. I'd like to make it disappear. The, what's What I was talking about now with the, the issue of our democracy, I would do away with a lot of the well, false information, the, the falsities that are being spread, the conspiracy theories that scare me. Judge, we have a number of people on the Zoom call here, and a few of people have already checked in to ask some questions, and I would like to be able to have anyone who's on the call ask a question. So, Noel, I see that you have a question. Can you unmute and ask your question? Hi there, um, Judge Brosnahan. Uh, thank you so much for talking to us today. It's been such an interesting program so far. I was just wondering if it would be rude to ask you how old you are. I don't know anyone <laughs> who... I, I am 86 years old. And sharp as a tack, very <laughs> sharp. Well, uh, I think that the fact that I'm, I'm married to somebody who keeps me sharp as a tack helps a lot. And also the fact that I try to keep mentally active. My my challenge is the New York Times crossword puzzles. And my mom used to say, my mom was not, died when she was in her 90s and she was quite sharp. And she said she didn't want to live past when she could, wouldn't come in first at Duplicate Bridge. <laughs> well, I don't know if I want to live after I can't finish the Sunday Times crossword. Nice, nice. Well, Thank you so much, Judge. Okay. Maria, do you have a question for Judge Brosnahan? Yes, thank you so much for being with us. My question was about your relationship with Justice Sandra Day O'Connor and what it was like for you when she was placed on the Supreme Court. I didn't see her after she went to the Supreme Court. Jim did, but when we were both young, we socialized because Jim was head of the Young Democrats for Kennedy and John O'Connor was the head of the Young Republicans. And so we socialized with John and Sandra at that time. And when Jim went back to Washington, he actually saw Sandra, who remembered him. And she was a lovely person, just an absolutely delightful person. And she didn't change when she went on the bench. Sharon Caesar, you have a question oh. for the judge? Hi, Judge Brosnahan. It's so good to see you. Do you miss no. us, Do you miss us at Behavioral Health Court? <laughs> uh, well, of course I do. We miss you too. What do you miss most about not being on the bench? Besides us at Behavioral Health Court, that is. <laughs> the people. Uh, the people and the fact that I can no longer make an impact Some like sometimes I was able to. I miss the people that I worked with who were oh, an incredible team of people, as you well know. But I also miss, miss some of the defendants. You know, it was interesting. We ha I had an interesting relationship with some of the defendants. The other day I was at a grocery store 
And this woman came running up to me and said, do you remember me? Do you remember me? And I didn't, i tell you the truth. But I said, well, how are you? She said, you were very nice to me every time I was in court. <laughs> and she had been a defendant in my court. And I, I, I miss that. We miss you, too. Dorothy Proudfoot, I see you on the screen. I haven't seen you in a while. And I'm wondering if you have a question or a comment for Judge Brosnahan. Well, sure. Thanks for calling on me, Lewis. I, I kind of suspected you might. It's so good to see you thriving. I'm very happy to see you. And I, I wanted to thank you for giving a shout out to the Earl Warren Inn of Court. I do have a question about judging. I think a lot of women lawyers are seeing that there is a very much a need to diversify the, the judiciary. From your perspective, based on your experience, what is it about being a woman judge is just so powerful for the bench? And what are the things that we should we should learn from you about that? I think it's like any other person whose background is different. Your experiences are, are different. And uh, everybody's technique of judging or ideas about what a judge should be depend on a lot on your own experiences. I think had I not experienced in my life discrimination based not only on being a woman, but on being a Jew, I would have probably been less understanding of people who are discriminated against for other reasons. And uh, that's why I think it's very important that there be diversity on the bench. Thanks, Dorothy. Jason Leong, I see that you've got a question. Sure. So thanks, Judge, again for doing this, and we really appreciate your time. I'm wondering what's next on the horizon for you, and what, what kinds of things are you doing now that you enjoy doing that you couldn't do before you retired? I do want to continue judging and I've signed up for the Assigned Judges Program, but right now I'm working, I'm writing a poetry book, and I'm enjoying that, and I'm reading a lot. I see that we have Judge Noah Wise on the call. I'm wondering if you have something, Your Honor. It's so nice to see you, and I apologize that I was late. I had a really long calendar this morning, and, and I will say, as much as you miss us, boy, do we miss you. And I, I hope that you will find all kinds of ways to continue to be part of, of the bench. In hindsight, is there anything that you would have done kind of differently in the trajectory of, of your, uh, your career on the bench? I would have pushed earlier for the collaborative courts because that's what I miss the most is the the one-on-one -on -one aspects. We have so few openings for people to participate in the mental health court that it, it's it's really frustrating. So they end up either at John George or in custody. And they what they really need is treatment. Do you mind if I follow up on that question? I'm I'm sort of intrigued with this. I yeah. I is that okay? I, I, I've actually been doing some research on this very issue, and I'm thinking about trying to, to write a little bit more about this. And, and Carol, your ability to see individuals for their unique humanity was just such a special gift that you had on this court. And, and I'm curious from your expertise and all of your years doing this, what would be the kinds of services that we would enhance, maybe at a time right now where we're in an intersection with having more money on the horizon to, to be able to do something with that. What I would do is create housing units that included the addiction, the mental health. You may house fewer people, but if you have a, con a unit, a house which has not only apartments, which they may or may not be able to sustain, but a counselor, an addiction program, you, you know, if you look at what Options Recovery Service has accomplished, they have now, I think, nine clean and sober houses for people who have gone through the Options Program. 
So it can be done. It certainly can be done, but you can't just dump them into an apartment and say, okay, now you've got a bed, good for you, and goodbye. Richard Seabolt, I see you're on the call. I wondered whether Judge Brosnahan might have some specific advice for undergraduates, either who are interested in law schools and perhaps particularly for women undergraduates. I would say take take a class that on psychology, but I don't think any particular curriculum is important. I think that you have to evaluate your ability to take tests. The LSAT does not determine who's going to be a good lawyer, but it sometimes does determine whether you can get to be a lawyer. But I would say start looking at the people who surround you every day in the coffee shop, on the street, the homeless person who you might otherwise be tempted to avoid your, to divert your eyes from. And I would say, if you want to go to law school, think about what are your, what are your best skills and what are the skills you need to work on. And the most important skill, I believe, for any judge is the ability to empathize. And so work on your empathy skills. Thanks, Judge. Erica Dennings, I see you're on the call. Do you have a comment or a question for Judge Brosnahan? Good afternoon, Judge Brosnahan. This has been terrific. I feel like you're an icon. And I think that all of the things that you've said about really following your passion and doing something that you enjoy doing and bringing really your human side to the to the bench or to your job is really just spot on. I have been really passionate about volunteer work. And so it's great to see that you're a person that really cares about the community and cares about humanity. You are awfully nice to say that. And good luck to you. Thank you so much. Lisa Simmons, I see you're with us today. And I'm wondering if you have a comment or question for Judge Brosnahan. I think Erica just hit it. I just kept thinking, wow, your connection to humanity is inspirational. I understand that you're going to be involved in the community. We all hope for a very long time. One day, what is the legacy that you hope to leave both personally and professionally for all of us? I would like people to remember me as somebody who cared about them. And that's that's about it. Judge Brosnahan, on that note, I will say that, unfortunately, because of time, we really kind of have to wrap up this conversation. Just thank you all for participating. I think that Lewis's Love love Your Lawyer is, is a good idea because the reputation that lawyers have is, is really, I believe, unfair. If, if anybody keeps our country together and keeps our democracy together and keeps our constitution together, it's not going to be anybody other than the lawyers. Judge Brosnahan, thank you so much for joining us today at the Alameda County Bar Association and on the Love Thy Lawyer podcast. It's been a real privilege and honor to talk to you. Bye. That's it for today's edition of Love Thy Lawyer in collaboration with the Alameda County Bar Association. Please visit the lovethylawyer.com website where you can find links to all of our episodes. Also, please visit the Alameda County Bar Association website at acbanet.org where you can find more information about our support of the legal profession promoting excellence in the legal profession, and facilitating equal access to justice. Special thanks to ACBA staff and members, Kaylin Dalen, Saeed Randall, Adasa Hayashi, Vincent Tong, and Jason Leon. Thanks to Joel Katz for music, Brian Matheson for technical support, and Tracy Harvey. I'm Lewis Goodman.
And my job was to tell Senator Orm, stand up. It's time to introduce this bill and then pull on his coat to have him sit down. That was my job as the secretary to the Judiciary Committee. 